Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Golden Spotlight here on 22 West Radio. Yes, this is the show where I, every week I have a new guest and I get them to share their story. So at this time, I'd like to start off with having my guests uh, introduce themselves. So let me know, um, tell me your name. Uh, hi, I'm Nidia Mora and I am a project coordinator at the nonprofit organization From Lot to Spot. Excellent. Well, I'd like to have my guests start off in the beginning. Tell me, uh, what was life, early life like? Uh, what was, you know, life in K-12? Um, so uh, K-12 was fun for the most part, but um, I did grow up in a low-income community of color, and um, we experienced decades of disenfranchisement, which left my community pretty much in shambles. Uh, my neighborhood was riddled with violence and crime, um, poverty run rampant and uh, my high school experience wasn't too fun like um, yeah I felt like the treatment of students at my high school was like very oppressive um, our entire high school was completely fenced off we couldn't um, step out during lunch or breaks um, if we tried walking down the hall, we'd immediately get harassed and interrogated by the faculty. So, like, as students, um, I personally didn't feel respected and, um, yeah, were valued. And, uh, so in high school, would you say you were, uh, outgoing? Were you shy? Did you get involved in any um, activities on campus? I was, I wasn't outgoing, but I wasn't shy. Um, I did play um, tennis for a few years, I was in varsity, and uh, that was fun, yeah. And uh, was that something you did because of like a PD requirement, or you just like... Uh, no, I just thought it'd be, it'd be fun, and I didn't want to be in PE, because it was, PE was just like filled with, with, um, I don't know, I just felt like tennis would have more structure than PE. PE, they would just give you balls and send you out to the field to do whatever. And uh, so, as um, many would say that senior year is the most stressful, what was senior, like, uh, senior year like for you? In high school? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it was all right. It wasn't too tr too stressful. I think junior year is the most stressful because that's when you're applying for everything, for all the colleges and taking all the SATs and all that stuff. But senior year was pretty easy. I was pretty much done with most of my core uh, requirements, so it was pretty. It was a pretty fun time. <laughs> now, usually as you're wrapping up high school, it's a moment of reflection. You know, you're wondering what's next and stuff like that. Did you already have a plan for what was after high school, or uh, what happened? Um, yeah, so, you know, growing up in a community where, where we didn't have enough resources and, you know, like, that negatively impacted my community, um, I wanted to go into a field that helped me improve communities, and um, so I chose to study urban and regional planning at Cal Poly Pomona. And uh, that major, uh, pretty much it like, it aims to um, improve the natural and built environment through inclusive democracy. So you right away moved a major, or did you like um, explore for a while? Well, I, I was thinking about architecture because I wanted to change my built environment. And then once I started talking to um, with the guidance counselors, they're like, "Oh, you know what? Like this sounds more like your alley, urban and regional planning." And um, basically what that is, um, you basically, um, you know, like learn tools to give, um, you know, the disempowered a voice, you know. And so, um, you know, the transition to college from high school and stuff, uh, did you feel lost being in a whole different campus? Did you um, get to start off with friends? I did, because I feel like our my high school um, didn't really prepare us enough for for college life. Um, I was on probation my first year of college um, because I really didn't have you know um, that guidance um, of someone. I'm I'm a first generation college um, graduate, so I, I was I was kind of lost and. Um, 
I was able to, um, you know, reach out to to clubs, and um, I was able to join some clubs. Um, I joined the um, American Planning Student Association, which is the a club um, for URP students, and that helped a lot. Um, it helped. Um, it helped find my place, help me find my place like in the school because it's just so big, you know, you can easily feel lost. And um, I found a community and I had great experiences and um, made lifelong friends. So the decision to uh, pick the school that you picked, um, was there a time where you were still debating between other schools or what happened? Um, I did, I was thinking of um, going to local schools like Cal State Long Beach, um, UCI, just like local schools around here, but um, Cal Poly Pomona um, is the only Cal State that offered that program. So I went I went there. Now, um, involvement on campus. Tell me, um, well, before we get into that, tell us about, you know, mentors and the importance of mentors. Did you have mentors? Uh, To be honest, I don't think I did have mentors. Um, I, I'm, I'm a very, like, um, I don't like asking for help too often, so I try to figure things out on my own. And um, I'm a very, like, independent working kind of person. So I, th I didn't reach out for mentor mentorship too often. I did reach out to peers and um, through the club and, um, I guess peer mentor mentorship was there. So uh, tell us the benefits of that. Um, just being able to reach out to your community and, um, you know, if you ever need help with anything, um, you can just reach out to them and, um, and they're there to help. Excellent. Now, um, there are some people who, they'll go straight to class They'll go to a class and then go straight home. But tell us about the benefits of you know, utilizing the resources out there on campus, including the clubs and student government and stuff like that. Yeah, I highly encourage to uh, encourage them to take advantage of all the resources available to them because it'll just enrich your life so much more and make your college experience so much richer, you know? And you really do get to experience things that you would have never experienced otherwise. And you get to build a community with those people. Now, everybody has that one subject that they're like, I had to get to that class to get to my finish line. Yeah. <laughs> what was that class for you? Um, I've always had trouble with English. English is not my, <laughs> my forte. I love reading. I just, I don't like writing. <laughs> but I mean, everything else, came pretty easily. I loved math and sciences. Those were like the funnest. They were always like a game to me. But it was English and literature that got me. <laughs> no, most, uh, I know you guys can't see me because right now this is a video too that I'm having, but you know, as the people are tuning in, you know, we have to, it's very rare to see someone, you know, <laughs> say that, you know, they actually enjoy math. <laughs> I did. It's fun. <laughs> um, so, um, tell us about the clubs that you were part of. So, uh, APSA, the American Planning Student Association, was a club for the urban and regional planning students. And um, we, we were part of the Environmental College of Design. And that was fun because we, we got to be a part of um, you know, just the entire college and got to meet the landscape architects, the architects, the graphic designers. So we, we saw what our college, um, you know, was capable of and the different routes that we were, that we could easily segue into. And that was really nice. And how about uh, student government and stuff like that? Did you get to participate in anything else or? Yeah, so I was, I was an active member 
in the club. I was a graphic designer, and um, all of my friends were also involved. So um, it felt nice. Like we were we were in a club. We were doing things, you know, making stuff happen. It was really cool. Um, there was one year where we all went uh, to a conference in New Orleans, and we all volunteered for the American Planning Association conference, and that was really fun. Um, we got to network. We got to explore the city, which was beautiful. And um, yeah, it's just a lot of fun. The process of running for like officer positions in college and stuff like that. <laughs> um, I mean, it was pretty. It was pretty fun. It was easy, like to get to a rally and like get people to try to vote for you. Um, be in like an inclusive democracy, which was fun, and um, getting to win is even better. <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, in case nobody uh, has had a chance yet to experience that, just imagine having to go and have a speech ready. Yeah. And, um, and try to make sure your speech is the one that really makes the people be like, yeah, we'll, we'll vote for you. Um, so time management, um, how, you know, obviously midterms and finals are perhaps considered the most stressful ones moments in um, college. Um, what was that like for you? What strategies you used to succeed? Oh, I was a procrastinator. <laughs> I was really bad at it. But I mean, sometimes we would get uh, get together in groups and um, have study sessions before, it, usually the night before. Um, stay up late and study really hard uh, with with um, other students that were taking the, the same test. So that that helped a lot to partner up with with other students. How about um, time management, uh, balancing things? You know, obviously uh, books can be expensive. Yeah. And, uh, you know, tell us, uh, did you have to work during school? What, what kind of jobs did you uh, um, have early on? Yeah, so I did work during college. All throughout college, I was an avid tutor at Santa Fe High School in Santa Fe Springs. I tutored groups of um, high school students from grade 9 through 12 in all um, academic areas to help them um, remain on track for college. And that's what I did for all throughout um, my college experience. And then I also did a few, um, I helped out with like on-campus conferences that we would have for the College of Environmental Design. I was um, a project coordinator assistant. And um, I think those experiences really helped me in, in what I'm doing now. Yeah. So to give an idea of people uh, what your major is exactly and like uh, what it encompasses, the degree that you got. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I kind of describe it as um, architecture in a sense because it does involve in um, manipulating your environment to be as efficient as possible, but instead of focusing on a building, you focus on entire cities, entire regions. So um, your main, our main goal is to provide um, citizens with the adequate resources for them to survive and thrive. So uh, tell me, what happened um, after that, after school and stuff, the jobs leading up to where you are today? Yeah, so after school, after graduating, I decided that I wanted to live abroad for a little while. And I decided to live in Spain for a few months. And um, that was my first time in Europe. So I uh, decided to travel the entire time I was there. And it was amazing. It was pretty cool. Food stories! <laughs> I was actually really disappointed in the food there. I mean, we're in LA. We're like in the we're one of the world's metropolises. We can get whatever food we want, the best food we want. You know, the best food that is out there is here. We can have it here. And out there, it was okay. It was all right. It wasn't like there was okay. So in Italy, yes, um, I had amazing pizza and amazing pasta. It was incredible. We stayed at. Um, we stayed for like a few weeks at this um, really resort um, town, or these little clusters of towns called Cinque Terre. And it was just picturesque, beautiful um, little villages that you could hike to from place to place. There were like 
on a cliff. It was really beautiful, and everywhere we went there to eat was amazing. That was very memorable. Yeah, it was awesome. Cool. What was that uh, that dish you were uh, saying? The what? The dish. Oh, pizza. Oh, okay. It was, <laughs> I was just eating was, all the pizza I could find. It was amazing. <laughs> cool, cool. Uh, so was this through school, or, or no. you just like paid out of pocket to go do that? Um, yeah, I saved up. I saved up um, some money because I, for sure, right after school, I wanted to take like a nice little break, and uh, I went out to live uh, live out there with some friends. Um, they were actually they're actually um, Cal State Long Beach uh, alumni, and they went abroad to um, teach English and they had a room up for rent and they let me know about it and I was like, hey, I'll do it, let's go. <laughs> and I went and I was on a three month long vacation. It was awesome. How about uh, like as far as like communicating like the language and stuff like that? Um, I'm a native Spanish speaker so it was kind of easy but it was still pretty difficult because of um, the accents there it took a it took some time to getting used to at first I it sounded like a like a foreign language to me it didn't even sound like Spanish because of the accents but after like a week or two I was able to to figure it out and I I was able to um, to figure out what they were saying and it was awesome because like it was like learning an, an entirely new language you're immersed in this entirely new world environment and it's it's pretty amazing do you remember some stuff huh can you say some stuff or? Well, I knew, like the slang, um, they, they call each other like tío and tía instead of like bro or dude. They'll say tío, tía, or um, I don't know, I can't remember, but like it's it's funny. Their slang is funny. Cool. And what happened afterwards? So after that, I came, I came back home and um, I got a job at the um, American Apparel Factory. I was an operations manager and uh, product manager for their vintage line, so I oversaw that entire operation, and that was really fun. Um, I, I was able to like design pieces, and what I did was, I was also a buyer, we bought um, vintage clothing in bulk, and then we, we repurposed those materials into new styles, and that was awesome. That was really cool. Mm -hmm. Had a, a little sustainable, um, Sustainability incorporated in it because um, the the clothing manufacturing um, realm is very wasteful sometimes. And then what happened after? After that, um, I my, a friend let me know about an internship opportunity with From Lot to Spot. They were looking for a project coordinator intern, and I decided to apply. And um, a few months later, I got hired on as the project coordinator. Now tell us, uh, for those that don't know, what is From Lot to Spot? So From Lot to Spot is a nonprofit organization. Uh, we're dedicated to transforming vacant lots or underutilized spaces into community-led and community-designed green spaces, like parks, community gardens, walking trails, um, urban tree canopies, and our number one goal is to have the community's um, voice lead the vision and the design of those projects. Now, um, how can people find from Lots of Spot in case they've never heard of it and they want to check out like a website yes. and, and uh, stuff like that? So, um, from Lots of Spot, we have a website, www.fromlotospot.org. Um, we also have um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, our handles, our handle for all of those, is from lot to spot. Yeah, and we have we're always posting um, events that we're having, coming up events, um, any other resources available to them. Like today, we posted um, another organization's uh, free resource that they're offering. They're they're offering to do free taxes. Um, yeah, so we, we partner up with a lot of other organizations as well to um, get our, our message across. So tell us about the history of the organization. Yeah, so From Lot to Spot started about nine, ten years ago. And the founder um, started it because um, she also grew up in a low-income community and um, 
as she started going to school, she went to school to like a more affluent part of town and she saw the stark differences between, you know, her community and like, um, you know, where she went to school. She saw lush green parks um, where she went to school and then when she got home, back home there was nothing, just a concrete jungle, you know. And she really wanted to make a change and um, decided to create from lot to spot to um, to transform a lot of the, the underutilized spaces in our communities and transform them into community-led um, green spaces. Now, um, you guys do a bunch of stuff, and yeah. um, I want also to, can you explain to people, like, uh, what are grants? Yeah, so grants are um, pretty much money given, to, given for a certain purpose or a certain project. And um, there are certain guidelines that one needs to follow in order to um, keep the money for those projects. Like for example, um, last year we got awarded for a Clean Streets Challenge, Clean Streets LA Challenge grant. And that involved um, two community cleanup events that we held in the neighborhood of Boyle Heights, where our office is at. And what we did there is um, we planted, we did a huge cleanup event uh, one day where um, we cleaned up uh, Cumming Street between 1st Street and 4th Street, which was basically a dumping ground in this residential area. We found mattresses, um, buckets of oil, just like anything and everything you can imagine, it was just littered there. And we had over 75 participants attend that day to help clean up the entire, that entire stretch of the street and um, we also installed a um, a um, what do you call this a, a rain garden which acts basically like a sponge to help absorb rainwater and uh, we also um, had the community finish the installation by planting native plants there and um, part of the grant uh, requisite was to have the community learn about um, the my three my LA what is it my my LA three eleven app, which is an app that um, you can report any illegal dumping graffiti. You just it's really easy. You just take a picture and write down the address or the cross streets where it's at and um, send it send it over and the city the city sanitation bureau cleans it up. So for that for those events. Um, we had to do like a um, interactive community engagement to help um, teach the community about these resources available to them to help keep, keep their communities clean. And uh, we were able to uh, win, win the grant and uh, we got the, an award called um, the before and after. So um, we did quite a bit of work and it looked like a completely different street after that. So we won an award for that as well. So the process for like getting one, like what is it like? You gotta like write an essay or something, or so how does it they're go? they're all different. This one involved did involve like um, it, it involved a report. Um, you include all the metrics, how many trash trash bags you were able to fill, um, how many native plants you planted, um, the benefits to the community, and um, we also um, provided. Uh, pictures as well, before and after images, and that really helped a lot too. So each each grant is different depending on um, on what they're asking for. And uh, so um, the projects, because it's not just like one specific city you guys work with. We, you guys work no. with like a ton. Like, tell us about that. Yeah. So we work in. Uh, low-income communities of color in areas that need this green space. So we usually work in, we have some projects in uh, Southeast LA developing, South LA. Um, we have another one developing in Echo Park. Um, yeah, we're just all, all over LA County, but in places that need green space the most. And um, in the nine short years that we have been um, 
open, we've uh, opened and organized four parks, five community gardens, a bicycle trail, and a large urban tree canopy. And we're um, in the process of doing a third one as well. So that's like over 11 projects in the last nine years in those communities. And like, I think the thing that surprised people too is, you know, you guys have done so much and you guys are a small organization. Like, you yeah. guys have like a small amount of people, right? Yes, there's only um, four of us at the moment. There's executive director, Viviana. There's a community organizer, Enrique. Uh, the project manager, Maria. She does everything, she's amazing. And me, the project coordinator. And um, what I do, my, my role is that I assist the project manager and the project um, and the community organizer to make sure that any events or projects are carried out successfully. So what that means is that um, I do organizing, scheduling, um, sorting, sorting out logistics, creating flyers, uh, brochures, anything that we might need to help um, you know, help have those um, events be successful. And then I also, I also do a lot of, I do all the digital outreach, and I also help out with face-to-face -face community outreach during events as well. So tell us about the, you know, the PR aspect of uh, organization. Yeah, so it's very important. It's extremely important, especially now that everyone, that everyone's gone digital, everyone has their phone, they're always on. Instagram, they're always, you know, checking their social media accounts, and it's really important to be able to reach communities um, through those uh, platforms. Um, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's really important, and it's, it's gotten a lot easier on our part. Like we still do phone calls, we still do door to door, but we do find that um, the digital outreach it, it, it plays a big part. Tell us about the volunteer opportunities too. Yeah, so because we're such a small organization, we rely heavily on volunteers. We are always looking for volunteers um, to help out during all of our events. We have a ton of events coming up. We, we uh, in March, towards the end of March, March 31st, we're having this huge volunteer event during the Cesar Chavez Day of Service. And, um, we're gonna have a huge event at our Lennox Community Garden um, to help, you know, show show the garden some garden some love. Um, we might build some new um, garden uh, beds, some new garden beds, just help weed, maybe plant new um, fruit trees, stuff like that. And um, we definitely need a lot of help with uh, with our volunteer events. Um, we're also looking to expand our team. We're looking for um, interns, project coordinators, uh, and um, community organizers. We're always looking for community organizers to help us um, on the ground build those relationships with the community, you know, to get these projects going. And what are the requirements to become an intern? Um, just shoot us over your, your resume. You just have to um, be passionate about um, you know, change, positive change in your community and want to want to be a part of that change. So, um, they have to be like out of high school already or? No, we accept, we accept high school students, college students, um, graduates, anyone and um, everyone who's willing to, to help for, you know, help the cause. <laughs> now, um, obviously you guys are big, you know, on, on like, you know, the earth and, and stuff like mm -hmm. that, you know, the environment. Um, tell us what Earth Day is, you know. Um, Earth Day is a day um, to bring about awareness of um, the impact that we have on our planet and um, the importance of, of treading lightly and um, caring for our natural environment. And I think uh, a lot of people, like it's a big day, a lot of different organizations host, you know, events and um, like education, um, education fairs and events, just, you know, trying to educate people on their impact. I know, that was so cool. One time I remember seeing one and they even had like 
like a car show kind of, but it was a small amount of cars, but there were like alternative cars. Nice. So that also like brought like a whole new audience to at the time. Uh, I think it was like at Cerritos. That was pretty cool. Um, so tell us um, about the accomplishments as well that the organization has had. Yeah, like I mentioned before, we've had over 11 projects completed in the nine short years that we've been running. And um, we've built everything from uh, walking trails, bicycle trails, um, community gardens, parks, and urban tree canopies as well. And um, Can tell us about like how each thing like encompasses. Like, take for example, like you know, in my city, uh, Linwood, mm -hmm. you know, had uh, the linear park, mm -hmm. and you know, there's yeah. like different elements in the stuff that like for each project, like. Uh, how the involvement of the community comes into play as well. Yeah, so the community the commu community is involved since day one. Like without them we, we we can't do what we do because what we want is to empower them to transform their own community. We want their voice to lead the project, to, to lead the vision of what what the project will develop into, you know? They're 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 the number one stewards of of that space are going to be using it on a daily basis, so they need to uh, be involved in every step of the way. And um, we make sure we do that in all of our projects. Um, we, we are on the ground, our community organizer is on the ground constantly communicating with, um, you know, with all the stakeholders involved and making sure that their voice um, is communicated through the project. And you know another uh, uh, nifty thing about um, you know some parks is uh, we're starting to see popularity even in dog parks. Tell us about yeah. that. Yeah. So um, our Lara Linear Park in Linwood, it does have a a, um, a dog park, and that's because the community wanted to include a dog park. Um, dogs are amazing. <laughs> we need more dog parks. And uh, they expressed that they wanted a dog park, and um, they got it. And uh, with a lot of our projects, we um, tried to have them be multi-benefit projects. So there has to be a sustainability element, um, a community engagement element. Um, the functionality has to be appropriate for um, the community's needs. So it has to. It has to. You know has to be beneficial in multiple aspects for it to, to be sustainable and to last. Are there any, like, um, what are, like, the requirements in order to be able to open one like that, a, a dog park and stuff like that? Um, it takes some permitting, permitting but um, depending on the city, it might be a little bit um, tougher to do. Um, but it just, it really depends on the city and... Um, how willing they are to work with the community's needs. And if they're not, we'll put pressure on them. <laughs> we also see uh, some popularity in uh, um, what is it? Like workout stuff in yes. parks. Tell us about that. Uh, that is very important. Um, our communities definitely need um, places to, you know, to have opportunities for, um, for health, healthy living, healthy lifestyles. Um, in most of our projects, we do we do have um, fitness equipment available because the community has expressed that they they want and they need that kind of um, those kind of resources. And in in all of these you know communities, there are no safe spaces you know to go walking, to um, to run, to jog. You know, so we uh, a big part of what we do is to provide those safe spaces where the communities feel comfortable to go in and you know and work out and be healthy and, you know, start a healthy lifestyle. So, like, for for building those kind of things, like, is there, like, um, like to get the materials and stuff, is, mm -hmm. um, how does that work, those ones? The so, the projects that we, that we develop, they're, um, we work with multiple partners. We work with multiple landscape architecture firms. Um, where they can help us um, find vendors to, you know, to find the appropriate equipment. So we do, we, 
we don't work alone. We work with partners to help you know develop these projects. Another uh, cool um, feature I noticed too with some parks is uh, they got this like built-in system where like it collected the rain so that it could like keep watering itself type yes, thing. Yes, yeah. So um, we just opened a park, uh, Bicentennial uh, Park in Hawthorne. Uh, before it was the newly renovated park, it was pretty much an abandoned park that was gated off. It was just like two. It was two rusting um, tennis courts that um, weren't culturally relevant anymore and the community wasn't really using them. One, because they weren't maintained. They had no nets. It was just, it was just a concrete um, square, you know? So we got the community involved um, and um, in, in the development, in the design, um, we wanted to incorporate um, water capturing systems, so that's what we did. We um, we included a um, what is it called? What is it called? Oh, it's a it's a storm a, uh, storm water capturing where it's it acts like a sponge where whenever it rains, instead of having the water run off into the into the ocean. Um, into the gutters, it collects the storm water and it, it um, replenishes our aquifers, our natural aquifers. Tell us about the involvement also of like, um, like take for example over there, there's a, there's a bench, but it incorporated like, a, like designs, like, oh, like yeah. there's artistry that have been involved and stuff. Yeah, so uh, for Bicentennial Park as well, we held a lot of, um, community workshops, mosaic workshops, where um, we had an artist come in that specializes in creating these mosaics, which is these little tiny pieces of uh, clay, design clay, and um, you put them together and it forms like a bigger picture. So um, we had the community involved. Um, we had a workshop where they created um, they created these pieces that became a piece that became part of the um, the park. So it really, uh, what we do is we try to empower the community, you know, to to have it be easy for them and accessible for them to change to be part of uh, positive change in their community, you know, have them be involved in this positive change. Wow, we have a fan that really enjoys watching. Oh, nice! Oh, wow. Thank you for the viewers who are tuning in and. Uh, Pressing the screens because if you uh, if you've been familiar with Periscope, if you tap your screen, like this flying heart appears, it means you <laughs> like what you're watching right now. So thanks for listening, everybody. Um, so yeah, um, tell us about the rules and stuff, the requirements, also to start like a, a community garden. Um, so our community gardens, uh, our newest one that we opened in 2016 is the Heart of Watts Community Garden. And that one was um, some students from Verbum Day, I'm sorry, from uh, Jordan, Jordan Downs High School. They reached out to us. Um, they let us know about this vacant lot that had been vacant for over 30 years. And um, it, was, it sat right in front of their school and they really wanted something to happen. And so we partnered up with the students and we got their input and um, we helped canvas the area to ask, you know, we went door to door, asked the community, what do you need? What do you want to see in this space? And most, mm, uh, most of them wanted um, healthy food options because in Watts, there are, it's a, it's a, it's a food desert out there. There's no um, healthy food options. In every corner you can find a Jack in the Box, you can find McDonald's, but there's really no um, grocery stores that um, these families can walk to. So what they needed was a community garden. And so um, we got the community's involvement. We had an activation day where we had the students and community members um, you know, go to the lot and um, 
we created this big sign and everyone put like their handprints in support of change. You know, we want, the, this is what we want to see. We want a community garden here. And that really ignited, uh, it was like a snowball effect that um, it got us, um, you know, a lot of support from the city and, you know, the, the entire community. And from there, we, um, we got partners to uh, help construct, construct the um, community garden. And uh, now we have about 26 garden beds. And we're always accepting, I think we have a few open spaces. So if anyone's interested that lives in the Watts community, um, if they're interested in starting their own little uh, garden, we have spaces available. So tell us about you know the community committees that are formed in the process of, for every time a project comes about. Yeah, so since the inception of a project, we always want the community's involvement. And um, we create, um, like for Bicentennial Park that just opened last year, um, we created a park advisory committee. So um, we involve community members from around the neighborhood to really be involved in in the process and even after the grand opening to you know stay involved and activate the space with like programming or certain events that they want to happen and we are there to support them now i always like to say that uh, you never know who can be listening and it could be that somebody who's watching um they might be specifically wanting to have the career that the guest has. So I always give my guests to give tips um, for some of them may be interested in the, the degree you got, the major you were in, or the career you're in. Yeah, so I think it's, um, it's super important now more than ever, I think, especially in this political climate, that if you, th if you feel like something isn't right, um, you should do something about it and you can, you know, you have the power to change your environment and your community and empower them, you know, to, to, to create better, you know, environments for people to thrive, you know. My two big questions I always ask. First one, where do you see yourself after retirement? <laughs> huh. So, I would love to travel the world. I think um, I just love immersing myself in like new environments, new cultures, new experiences, and I think that is a great way to do to do just that. So um, traveling, I think I'll find myself doing that. <laughs> cool. Now, what would you like your legacy to be? Hmm. Um. I guess I would want to have had empower people to fight for, you know, what they believe in and um, for sustainable and equitable environments and to have them know that no matter, you know, their socio or economic, you know, stance in life, they deserve um, to have resources available to them that helps them thrive. How can our audience reach you? Um, so you can reach me at um, my email, which is nidia at fromlottospot.org, and it's nidia, N-Y-D-Y-A, at fromlottospot.org. And then you can always reach us um, through our social media platforms. Uh, we have Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook, and um, our handle for those platforms is fromlottospot. No. Uh you know, throughout, you know, the times, you know, you've, you've gone through different jobs and stuff like that, you're in your career right now. Um, obviously, uh, in today's society, people say that, you know, it's important to be bilingual. Tell us about the benefits of being bilingual. Um, so being bilingual in the field that we're in is super important because we need to be able to communicate um, to the community we need to be able to communicate to community members and the communities we work with in the communities that we work in and um, without with that language barrier you really can't get things done or you really can't get those ideas across you can't really establish those lines of communication 
So, um, like for example, our community organizers, they have to be bilingual because we work in um, bilingual communities, uh, mostly Sp uh, Spanish-speaking communities, and we need to be able to communicate with them. Now, another thing that, um, you know, when you guys have events, I remember like the, the snacks you guys provide are also healthy too. Sometimes. <laughs> Um, so tell us about, um, you know, how you educate, uh, especially uh, today's youth when you uh, have like meetings and stuff or events. Yeah, so at our community gardens we hold, um, we hold like, um, uh, like cooking classes or like cooking, you know, um, We'll do like seasonal cooking classes to like show our gardeners what they can do with certain types of vegetables, seasonal vegetables that um, they could be growing. So we really um, try to educate and um, educate our, our gardeners in uh, healthy lifestyles and not only that, just knowing how to, how to cultivate and um, how, to, how to eat the food, the healthy food. And um, we find it's important to have um, you know these families be involved in these community gardens because they do bring their children and they do have them help out and it's important to uh, get them exposed to healthy living lifestyles. Yeah, I remember uh, one time seeing kids uh, I think they got to draw like I guess there was a uh, picture to the earth and they got to color it in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, you guys have different activities and stuff too. Yeah, at, at every event we try to, you know, make it a, a education experience and have the community, um, you know, take, some, take something away from it. Any, any other tips you have for people that want to be just like you? <laughs> just go out there and do it. Um, find like-minded individuals that are striving towards the same goal and uh, create that support system. Uh, power in numbers, you can do it. What about advice to the quiet people, the antisocial people? Um, I consider myself um, a quiet person. I'm not one to, you know, to go out. I, I'm more. My motto is, "Don't talk about it, be about it." So, <laughs> so I'm not. I'm not like a big talker. But um, if I do believe in something, I'll figure a way to to accomplish it. Oh, cool. So. Um, what, what do you get to do on your free time since, uh, you know, you're balancing so many different things? Are you uh, thinking about going back to school or, or anything? Um, or? Yeah, I am actually. I, I also work for the County of Los Angeles Public Library. So I want to go back and um, get my master's in uh, library science. And I want to, you know, um, make an impact in the public library realm. Cool, cool. What is it like working at a library? Uh, it's amazing. It's awesome. There's books everywhere. I love books, but it's it's um it's pretty awesome because you know you're there to you're you're there to serve the public and to you know help provide um, educational resources for them to you know expand expand their education. Yeah, and then um for those that aren't familiar with you know. Well, obviously, I've got to be familiar with the library, but, you know, if people haven't been to a library in a long time, yeah. there's DVDs now there. Yes. I mean, we're, it's constantly evolving. We cater to the public, and whatever they need, we find ways to provide for them. We have um, certain libraries that have 3D printing machines. We have um, computer literacy programs, so we, we cater to um, you know our demographics, our audience, whatever they need. We provide the programming for them. So if you need help um, with your resumes, we hold resume workshops. Um, uh, Spanish uh, English learners, we have book clubs. Um, we have anything and everything you can imagine, and we have DVDs as well. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. The the library has amazing resources, and they're all free. Now, another thing that I noticed is that the library has this feature where I guess if you owe money and you're a minor, there's a way to. Yes, they they just um, 
they just um, rolled out that program. It's called The Great Reader Way, and for um, patrons 21 and younger, they have the option to read away their fines. For every hour that they read in the library, they get $5 taken off their account. So that is an option um, if you have any fees, and I think that's pretty amazing. So does that uh, apply to like, they have to like uh, go to like a group of like elementary kids and to them, or how does it? No. Work? So they all they have to do is walk in, um, just let us know that they want to do the read away. We register them. We start their time. They have a seat. Read in the library for as long as they want. Come back when they they want to check out, and then we deduct the the amount for the time. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Now. Um, we are down to like the last like three minutes, but um, any more, uh, you know, what else can you tell us, uh, you know, you know, for those young minds that are listening, to, you know, why, you know, those kids that sometimes are like, I don't know if I want to go to college, yeah. you know, what do you have to say to those students that they think, well, maybe I'll just take like a year off or something after high school? Well, uh, I think that it's never too late to learn to go back to school and I think it's really important to be able to expand your mind and learn you know you learn so much in your college years you learn not only academics but you learn a lot about yourself and so I believe that life is a learning experience and you should go to college to learn you know and stay stay up to date you know not not only on developing yourself but on developing your you know the tools of the trade that you're interested in also I think that you know some people should realize that like it's okay like it's not a bad thing if you change your mind yeah. about what you want to like major in exactly all of everything takes time you are your own person you need to you know allow yourself the time and you know there's no there's no it's not a race it's your life you live it the way you want and um, I would definitely encourage them to continue, you know, their education. It enriches your life so much more. It's amazing. Well, I want to thank you for taking the time to be here on the Golden Spotlight. Thank you for having me. And this concludes this episode, ladies and gentlemen. Until next time.